Five years ago when I joined DARPA, we were faced with the following problem. The military sends millions of its members across the globe, and in most of those locations, there is no infrastructure, and there is no medical infrastructure. So when this soldier falls ill, we can't just simply send him to the urgent care clinic or the CVS, and there's often not even anyone trained to take a blood sample. And so we were faced with the challenge of how do we diagnose this soldier in a way that's accurate and robust, no matter where in the world he or she may be. And so we set about investing in and building two sets of technologies. The first, how do we enable him to take his own blood sample? The second, how do we ship that sample back to a clinical laboratory anywhere in the world without having to worry about stabilizing it on a block of ice? After about two or three years, these technologies began to pay off. And what we realized was that we had something much larger than just the military application. But we had something that could transform our healthcare system and specifically enable us to begin to personalize and create predictive medicine. Now, most of us are familiar with personalized medicine by way of genomic sequencing. And the goal here is that all of us sequence our genomes and we begin to compare the various differences between each one of us and understand how those differences might lead to and create different disease states. The challenge with genomics is that it's relatively static. It tells us fate, but it doesn't necessarily tell us state. And what we care about is not just do I have a propensity for having a disease, but when am I coming down with that disease? And if I am coming down with that disease, how do I know if my treatment is working? And that information is not carried by the static information of the genome, but it's carried by the expression of the genome in terms of the dynamic RNA and proteins that are being expressed and are essentially the traffic patterns of our bodies. What we wanted to be able to build was ways for the human body. Now, you may say to me, Alicia, we already do this. When I go into my doctor, he takes a blood test, and I, and I look at my biomarker levels, and this tells me if I'm healthy or not. But in reality, what we're doing is that we're taking dynamic systems. We're taking things that change regularly over time in response to our own state of health and our environment, and we're just taking these single snapshots in time. First, when we're young, during our age-specific checkups, and then only usually in periods of illness, when we don't feel well and we're in the doctors. And then what we do is we don't compare them to our own unique healthy levels. We compare them to a population average, which is typically a group of 50-year-old men in Denver. <laughs> what would be much more powerful is if we could imagine tracking ourselves consistently over time and frequently and creating our own kind of health fingerprint over time. And you can imagine that if we could track this over millions of individuals, we could begin to build up a, a set of knowledge that would enable us to not only understand when we are sick and what those biomarker patterns look like, but actually begin to predict the onset of disease. So let me make this very specific with a real world example. Let's start with ovarian cancer and cancer antigen 125. Cancer antigen 125 is known as a biomarker that enables us to actually diagnose ovarian cancer. Now, the challenge with this test is that it's used as a threshold test. So if I'm below a certain limit, I'm considered to be healthy and cancer-free. And if I'm above that limit, I'm considered to have cancer. As most clinicians will tell you, often by the time you're above the limit, it's too late. You have late-stage ovarian cancer, and it is very difficult to cure. The other major challenge is that most early stage ovarian cancer patients have a level that's below that threshold, and so they won't be caught by the system. The result is that most cases of ovarian cancer are diagnosed at a very late stage. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that we're assuming that every single individual who comes in for a CA125 measurement is average, and clearly we're not. Each one of us has a different baseline level of CA125, and a woman's value of CA125 can vary up to 40% over the course of a month. And so what we'd actually like to do 
is be able to track your levels over time and understand what's normal for you and how that varies over time and when you're deviating from that. Now, a very powerful study was released just a little over a year ago by a group of researchers in the UK and at Harvard Medical School. And what they did is they measured 50,000 women's levels of CA125 as infrequently as every year and as frequently as every 12 weeks. Now, on this chart, every great dot that you see up there is a measure of CA125 over the period of a decade. And what these researchers found was that regardless of whether you were above or below the threshold, if they saw a doubling of your cancer antigen 125 over the period of six months, they could double the effectiveness of the biomarker and they could increase their rate of catching ovarian cancer up to 86%. This was astounding to me that just by changing the way that we were measuring a biomarker, we could double its effectiveness. And the first question I asked myself was, if this is true for ovarian cancer, what else might this be true for? And it turns out, for many of the major chronic diseases that we are facing, whether it's diabetes, neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular disease, and a variety of other cancers, there is a whole set of biomarkers that today are not considered to be very good, that we might have thrown out, that are not considered to be predictive, that if we change the way that we measure them, if we just simply measure them more frequently and compare them against our own natural levels, can actually start to be predictive of disease onset even before the symptoms begin to manifest. So we can start to imagine this very near future where we are monitoring ourselves and our families and being able to get this quantitative picture of our state of health, where we can begin to predict when illness is occurring and when we can be actually begin to understand if a treatment is effective or not. So why doesn't our healthcare system look like this today? Well, unlike when you go into your doctor and they simply do the tongue depressor, or they listen to your heartbeat, or they have you cough with these very simple tools. Getting your blood sample taken for a diagnostic test is something that is incredibly inconvenient. You have to schedule another appointment for it. It's costly for you and for the medical system, and it occurs outside your course of care. What you want is a tool that's as simple to implement as a tongue depressor or a stethoscope. You want something that doesn't require you to have a terrible user experience by going to the blood draw center out of your way. It is phenomenal to me that one of the most important things in our lives, our health, has this bad of a user interface. So the key insight that we had at DARPA and that led me to leave DARPA and to launch this new company was that the exact same technology that we were developing that would enable us to take a blood sample from a soldier anywhere in the world was the same technology that we could use to collect a sample from any of us, any time in our lives, anywhere in our lives. And it was that just key point and the ability of a simple change in technology and the way that we were changing our measurement that could transform our healthcare system and transform our lives that caused me to leave DARPA, launch a company, and hopefully transform our healthcare system. Thank you.